Thank you, gentlemen. All right, it is now my pleasure to introduce our international guest lecturer for today, Professor Paul Tam. This is going to be great, Paul. Everybody will be quiet by the time I finish my introduction because I'm going to go over your entire career, which should take about 90 minutes. Uh, Professor Tam graduated from the uh, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Hong Kong. I want you to pick out which one is him in this picture. I had some troubles. Um, and you remained on the faculty there until 1986 when he went to Liverpool as a senior lecturer. In 1990, he became the first full-time academic pediatric surgeon at the University of Oxford and established the training program there. In uh, 1996, he returned to Hong Kong to chair the Department of Pediatric Surgery and become in 2013 the Li Shupui Professor of Surgery. He is also Vice President of Research for the entire university. Paul is the ultimate triple threat, excelling in the practice of surgery, teaching, and research. He is ranked among the top 1% of most cited scientists, and his research continues to receive peer-reviewed funding. He was President of PAPS 2008 to 2009, He's an associate editor of the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. He has received numerous awards, including the BAPS Prize, Lifetime Achievement Award, and Honorary Fellowship of the American Surgical Association. It is an honor to host Professor Tam as he speaks on Hirschsprung's disease, a bridge for science and surgery. Uh, let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Michael. I'm, I'm speechless, um, I'm really humbled uh, in front of this uh, distinguished audience. Um, it gives me great pleasure and honor to speak to the uh, Association of, uh, American Association of Pediatric Surgeons, the world's leading organization in our specialty at this 46th an uh, annual meeting. I'm really indebted to uh, your president, Michael, uh, in uh, inviting me to give this talk. Um, uh, Dr. Ford yesterday and uh, Dr. Langer this morning uh, have set a benchmark so high that uh, it would be impossible for me to, to reach. So I'm afraid you have to lower your expectations <laughs> a little. I'm more sure conscious that I'm standing here between you and your lunch. <laughs> so, let's begin the journey. Now, in tackling the uh, modern world's challenging needs, progress is often best achieved through building bridges to bring about synergy between uh, groups of diverging talents and strengths. Hirschsprung's disease, a common cause of neonatal intestinal obstruction is a challenging condition for surgeons to treat. And it remains an enigma, albeit a partially solved one, to scientists. Over a century, Hirschsprung's disease has become a bridge for science and surgery to interact fruitfully. With major advances in the surgical management based on discoveries and um, inventions. Nevertheless, I would argue that the outcome remains unsatisfactory for many patients, and further improvement depends on a better understanding of the pathogenesis and the disease diversity of this very complex disease. The lessons we learn from Hirschsprung's disease will also serve as a model for advancing uh, our understanding in other uh, birth defects. So in this lecture, I will try to uh, uh, 
present 10 short stories or chapters. I will first uh, describe the historical account of the, um, um, major, the most important breakthrough in treatment. Then we'll have a critical look at where we are in terms of outcome. I will then try to dissect the cause of the disease by the understanding of normal, normal human uh, fetal development. This will then take us into some insights into the complexity of the normal ENS or enteric nervous system and its pathology. I will then take you through a um, personal journey uh, of gene hunting, beginning with what we call linkage analysis. Followed with the pursuit of the candidate genes and um, ending, not quite ending, uh, as I will show, with the fishing expedition of the Genome Wide Association studies. I will describe the um, importance of gene function, how non coding mutations uh, play an important role, and also the interaction of the gene, cell, and its gut microenvironment, how this provides a basis for our understanding of the pathogenesis and the diversity of the disease. And hopefully, with this foundation, this will lead us uh, into a uh, better understanding uh, of the disease and allow us to devise better care, both for Hirschsprung's disease as well as for other birth defects. So with these 10 chapters, uh, and if you find it a little bit too boring at each part, any part, then you can doze off and return knowing that uh, the path that we will take, they are each somewhat independent, but they are linked. It's fair to say that um, when Hirschsprung described the disease in 1887, that while he was credited with a detailed description of the um, condition, he did not get it right. You will note that uh, the title of the report was constipation in newborns due to dilatation and hypertrophy of the colon. And therefore, it's not surprising that in the intervening 60 years or so, treatment had been misdirected and focused on the grossly abnormal looking megacolon and therefore uh, non-operative treatment as well as operative treatment directed at the uh, megacolon have uniformly been proven to be um, ineffective. In fact, it led um, Dr. Ladd and Gross to say in 1947 that it is axiom axiomatic to say that no one has ever been cured of Hirschsprung's disease. All these changed in 1948 because of a brilliant discovery. And I will quote Dr. Swenson's own words in a letter that he uh, published in the journal of Pediatric Surgery. This operation, which we now associate with his name, was an experiment that proved our concept was correct. And his concept was that, could this be a physiologic obstruction? Here, you require a little bit of serendipity, like everything in science. A child with colostomy for suspected uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but was known to the um, Boston Children's Hospital to uh, be treated for Hirschsprung's disease, uh, was admitted. And this provided Dr. Swenson, the unique opportunity to test his hypothesis. 
by performing manometry on both limbs of the colostomy. This showed actually that uh, there was surprisingly active contractions uh, in the proximal limb, but no activity in the distal limb. He then went on to convince his radiology colleagues to perform very careful study um, of the distal colon with small amount of barium that, will, that then allow him to show that there was a narrowing of the distal bowel all the way down to the anal canal. And with this, then he went back to the laboratory to, de to develop a technique that will allow him to remove the colon down to the uh, anal sphincter while preserving continence. It was with this uh, evidence that he was able to convince his colleagues to allow him to perform this human experiment on patients in 1947, which was then published uh, the following year. So for the first time, the true nature of disease was unveiled and appropriate surgery uh, was devised. This together with the description in the same year by Sousa and um, Kernahan of the finding of aganglionosis of the rectum uh, provided the foundation for uh, effective surgery in modern times. It also allows us to weed out the Hirschsprungs from the non hirschsprung disease and therefore uh, have a pure population of patients to begin to understand the nature of the disease. Now we know that Hirschsprung's disease is a heterogeneous condition. It affects one in 5,000 live births in Caucasians and have a slightly higher preponderance in, of incidence in Asians. Five to 20 percent of the patients can, uh, 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 affected uh, in the familial uh, sense. There is a, a male preponderance affecting the common form, which is defined by the length of the agangenosis, that is the short segment uh, Hirschsprung's disease. And some patients are syndromic. So the modern management uh, until very recently, has been focused on the principle of removing the aganglionic bowel, reconstruct the intestinal tract by bringing the, the normal, in, normally invaded bowel down to the anus while preserving sphincter function. This was achieved uh, originally by the performance of a leveling colostomy to divert the stool in the first instance followed by the pull-through procedure and then a closure of colostomy. Now, the procedure was not technically uh, easiest, and the various modifications, including the Duhamel Soavi um, state ray mine, all these point to the fact that technically uh, the procedure may benefit from some um, uh, changes in allowing this ordinary surgeon to uh, perform the operation effectively. But it, one also will notice that despite all the mod modifications, we have actually retained a varying segment of agangenosis with, this with uh, all the procedures. Perhaps the next advance that one can associate was the uh, technological advances of the miniaturization of instruments and chip camera that allowed the development of minimal invasive surgery or laparoscopic surgery in children. And Keith Georgeson was the first to take advantage of this uh, laparoscopic uh, approach to modify the Sawavi procedure into a predominantly transanal uh, endorectal pull through. This was then followed by uh, others, Delatore, Jack Langer, and others, who 
uh, were able to perform the procedure uh, even without uh, laparoscopy or laparotomy. And like others in our hospital, we have also moved towards adopting this as a procedure uh, in preference to um, the Duhamel procedure, which we have been performing over the years. And it has become the most commonly performed operation uh, worldwide. Certainly, this has resulted in a shortened hospital stay and less trauma to the baby. But does this advance in the uh, surgical approach result in improvement in functional outcomes? In the review of the literature, it would be, be, begin to become clear that while Hirschsprung's disease nowadays is rarely fatal, there remains considerable morbidities, short term or long term, which can go all the way into adulthood. And that a lot of these associated with obstructive or soiling uh, symptoms. So in a uh, review of the publications of different methods of um, surgical approach, whether it is trans-anal uh, um, and rectal uh, pull-through or the conventional procedures, you often, often get a, a high uh, percentage of constipation uh, up to 10% and varying degree of uh, soiling of 30 to 50%. So I would say that there remains considerable challenges in the management of Hirschsprung's disease. First is that we have not devised the perfect operation. Removal of the entire pathologic distal bowel is incompatible with preservation of the anal sphincter and the sensory uh, reception in lower rectum. Secondly, as I will show later, we will be begin to appreciate that the mere demonstration of ganglia in the pull-through bowel does not necessarily equate with normal function. Thirdly, I will submit that the current approach of one-size-fits-all strategy or protocol for such a heterogeneous disease will not lead to perfect outcome. And here, we have not addressed the patient subset of different, different severity, syndromic patients, familial cases, and all the other uh, <clears throat> risk factors that we don't understand, including the race and the gender predilection. Then there's the extreme phenotype, where the outcome remains poor. So the intestinal agangliosis is typically a very difficult um, condition to treat. And there are even uh, other challenges that we might not be aware of, and that is the unknown comorbidity factors that our long, uh, longer surviving patients now may begin to exhibit. So, back to lab. Here I will describe to you a journey from surgery to science that begins in 1983 with a British Commonwealth uh, Fellowship um, in the, uh, uh, to Liverpool. I was fortunate to have two mentors, a surgeon, Professor James Lister, and a physiologist, Professor Graham Dockred. And we ask the question, can we improve uh, the management of Hirschsprung's disease through better knowledge? If we can, if we can, uh, can do that, then we will need better knowledge in the pathology and the pathogenesis. We will then be able to have a better diagnosis, and hopefully then we will be able to have better risk prediction and patient stratification, resulting in better treatment strategies. So how to go about this hypothesis in those day, early days? We know that 
the um, uh, enteric nervous system is formed from the, the uh, neural crest cells. But we do not know how they come about to be deficient in Hirschsprung's disease. Now we, of course, un know that the uh, enteric nervous system is a very complex uh, system. It has something like 500 million neurons, and therefore is sometimes known as the second brain. In order to understand the normal um, development, we undertook a study of the human fetal gut, thinking that this will be most direct, as this is a human disease. The first uh, uh, obstacle we encounter was that the conventional method of study with um, the routine H and E stain was not adequate to reveal the complexity of the system. So I embarked on uh, a um, course to learn how to do immunohistochemistry, which is a much more sensitive method of localizing proteins. At that time, the prevailing hypothesis of um, the development of Hirschsprung's disease is that there is a single cranial caudal gradient of uh, neural crest cell migration from the upper gut to the distal gut, and that failure of migration at any point will result in aganglionosis in the distal gut. On the other hand, this developmental biologists have provided some evidence in avian models to suggest that there's also a contribution of the sacral crest to the hindgut. So how do we reconcile the, the two uh, hypotheses? We studied human uh, tri uh, fetuses in the uh, mid-trimester period with a uh, neuromarker called neuron-specific analyze, which allows us to have a uh, analysis of the developing enteric nervous system at the three different levels, the pylorus, the ileum, and colon. And in fact, what we found was that there wasn't a single gradient that systematically goes down from pylorus through the ileum to the colon, but in fact that there appeared to be a double uh, gradient. The spin-off of uh, this and other study is that with the development of sensitive neural markers like neuron-specific analyze and microtuber-associated protein, subsequently these became um, markers for better diagnosis of Hirschsprung's disease. There is also an alternative hypothesis that therefore um, that perhaps it's not uh, the cells that are always the problem, that it could be that the cells do not migrate or stay there because of a hostile gut microenvironment. These were the evidences in the murine models. We, were, we then try to corroborate these findings by studying human aganglionic specimens, and we indeed showed that there was an abundance and abnormal accumulation of the extracellular matrix proteins represented by laminin and uh, fibronectin. Further to that, we investigated the complexity of the entire nervous system, again using immunohistochemistry, and studied neuropeptides, which are non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic neurotransmitters. And we show that the, the distribution of these uh, so-called peptidergic uh, nerves were abnormal, not only in the uh, aganglionic bowel, but also in the so-called oligo, 
uh, ganglionic valve or in the transitional zone. Thus, giving support to the argument that just the finding of ganglia in the bowel does not equate to a normal function and that we have to uh, evaluate uh, the bowel's function uh, with more sensitive markers. Another uh, non-adrenergic, non uh, non non um, neuromarker we studied was the nitric oxide synthase, something that you heard about uh, yesterday, and that these, uh, 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 the nitric oxide actually producing nerves are actually uh, inhibitory, and therefore they are, the, they are responsible for the non-relaxation of the aganglionic bowel and the um, um, uh, anal uh, sphinctoachalasia. This provided some uh, uh, basis for the medical treatment of anal achalasia using nitrates. It's all very well to perform these studies in uh, human samples, but very soon we begin to realize that uh, these findings were what we call descriptive and would never allow us to differentiate cause, effect, and association. By this time, there was a realization that there could be a genetic basis for Hirschsprung's disease. The clues came from the fact that there was a familial incidence of five to 20 percent, that there were syndromic cases, and there were also spontaneous mutant animals like the piebald lethal mice, the lethal spotted mice, uh, as well as zebrafish, horse, all of these suggested that in both in animals and in human, a genetic mutation could disrupt entire nervous system development and result in what we call the Hirschsprung's uh, phenotype. But where can we find the missing genes amongst this huge pool of thousands of genes in the 26 chromosomes that we each of us have? By that time, I moved to Oxford, that sweet city uh, with the dreaming spires. And so began my gene hunting journey. It was never going to be easy. And at that time, the prevailing method for trying to identify a gene is to do what we call linkage analysis. This is based on the principle that there is an aggregation, segregation of the disease genes with, the genet with some genetic markers. In those days, it was called microsatellite markers during meiosis, and that there is a high frequency in the affected families, and therefore using the markers, you will be able to uh, localize the uh, site of the um, chromosome which is affected by uh, that gene. I submitted a, a research grant, and here I share a little experience to cheer up particularly the, uh, the young uh, surgeon scientists in the audience. Uh, if you uh, have a failed NIH grant, don't get uh, too despondent. Uh, I thought it was a very well written grant, uh, and I actually worked together with a top geneticist to come up with that grant. And at that time, the estimation was that I need 200 families to find uh, the Hirschsprung's genes. We got the reviewer's comment to say that we're aware that uh, the Hirschsprung's gene is about to be uh, uh, discovered, and that most likely with the discovery of this gene, over 70% of 
patients uh, will be accounted for, and therefore undertaking such a huge uh, exercise for less than 30% of uh, the patients was not going to be a worthwhile exercise. So looking back, how wrong that, that was. Uh, even now, uh, of course, we don't know 70% uh, of the mutations. We don't even know 30% of the mutations. Fortunately, serendipity smiles on me. Um, I was treating a patient in 1991, and this patient came to me with intestinal obstruction and the diagnosis of a, a clinical diagnosis of meconium ileus associated with cystic fibrosis. And it was natural that we sent the samples also for genetic analysis. But I suspected that the patient may have a cause other than meconium ileus. So you, I did the rectal biopsy, and eventually it turned out that the child had total intestinal agangenosis. But then the genetic sample was analyzed, and they found a microdeletion at chromosome 10. And this, along with another report from Italy, actually then helped the gene hunters to narrow the search down to a tiny segment of chromosome 10 and rapidly resulted in the identification of the first ever Hirschsprung gene, direct gene, in chromosome 10, using only 15 pedigrees. We then interrogated the, the genome on this red mutations and see if we found the ultimate answer. And while it accounts for up to 50% of familial Hirschsprung patients, actually, to our disappointment, only 7 to 25% of sporadic Hirschsprung patients had coding sequence mutations. So the natural uh, response to that is that there must be other genes. With that, it was also time for me to go home. And in 1996, I relocated back to Hong Kong. But the gene hunting journey continued. So we started to look at what we call candidate genes by uh, looking at the directory of important biological uh, markers, one can then uh, have candidates who may be predicted to affect the entire nervous system uh, development. And therefore, uh, one can then do a uh, sequencing uh, of these genes in patients compared with controls. And with this, indeed, we identified FOX2B as uh, one of the of those of the, the new Hirschsprung's genes, and others following this approach have identified, for example, the natural um, corollary to having found the red gene is what about the lig their ligands or the receptors. So the GDNF nurturing uh, were also found to be uh, Hirschsprung's genes. So is the endothelial pathway uh, gene, as well as a few others. By this time, still less than 30% of the patients could be accounted for with this whole array of genes that we have found through this extensive search. Around this time, major advances in genomic sciences have taken place. The Human Genome Project has just been completed. With the, the completion of the Human, project, Human Genome Project, we now have a handle to the common code of the book of DNA for human. But it is 0.5% of the genetic variation that determine why you and I are different and why Hirschsprung's patients develop the disease. 
So the natural extension of that project was what we call the HapMap project, international HapMap project, based on the principle that the human genome exists uh, in a blocky structure, that large segments of DNA escape the shuffling of the genetic material during uh, meiosis between generations. These blocks of DNA are called haplotypes, and they offer a shortcut to find variant genes. So if you would like the hap map by providing a directory of all the haplotypes in different populations would provide a catalog of indicators like the post-it notes or in this case beetles associated with the 60s. When you think of beetles, you think of 60s. I was fortunate to be involved in this project uh, in the uh, Hong Kong team for which we were uh, responsible for some 70 million base pairs or the short arm of chromosome three which equals to 2.5% of the genome. And we have to complete this in 18 months. So with this, we acquired the know-how of high throughput automation uh, in genomic uh, research. We also uh, developed the bioinformatic cap capabilities that allow us to interpret these big data. This would then pave the way for me to uh, venture into what we call the genome-wide association study. Here in 2005 uh, could be found in this big team that announces the completion of the second generation uh, human genome project. So we conducted the GWAS or the genome-wide association on the basis that you can now examine the entire uh, genome for genetic variation and then using the uh, directory of uh, the HAP map. This will then allow us to associate uh, the culprit genes, which will have a higher frequency in patients compared to control. We undertook this study on um, 200 Hirschsprung's patients and 408 uh, controls using this gene chip technology and something like over Three, uh, 300 million uh, nucleotide changes were detected using this um, approach. And then we subject this to a very uh, elaborate bioinformatic process with the result that of a density map that I show you here that shows the, um, the log ratio of those, uh, the risk uh, associated with certain positions in the chromosome that are more frequently found uh, in uh, Hirschsprung's patients. Not surprisingly, red came up very strongly, but we also identified a, a possible uh, hot locus in chromosome eight, and subsequent study allow us to confirm that this is the neuroregulin one gene, which uh, can now be formally classified as a new Hirschsprung's gene. Now, all these uh, gene hunting was focused on the fact that genes that code that, that genes code for proteins, and that proteins affect uh, cell behavior. So, for a long time, it was believed that only coding sequence mutations were important. But coding uh, region only accounts for 2% of the genome. So the rest of the, the genome, the 98%, was for a long time considered as junk DNA, serving no useful biological function. 
until more recently, people realize that things exist because there's a reason. It, the reason that we did not know doesn't mean that it did not exist. So we came around to the idea that in fact, the non-coding region has important regulatory uh, function and that by extension, this may also have implications for Hirschsprung's disease. So we started to interrogate this question of whether the non-coding sequence mutation also uh, is relevant to Hirschsprung's disease. Here we showed that indeed there is a outline here in the red promoter, which is way away from the uh, coding region of red, that affects uh, uh, red ex uh, expression. And therefore, in a study of Chinese Hirschsprung's patient, shown in yellow, against control, shown in blue, we demonstrated a very high frequency of this non-coding mutation. Furthermore, by comparing this as well as one additional um, non-coding sequence mutation, which is also present in Caucasians, the so-called um, T uh, mutation, T allele, we can show that it also is higher amongst all Caucasian uh, population, but somewhat lower than the Chinese population in general. And this may account for the fact that Chinese Hirschsprung's patient um, has a high incidence of um, the disease. We further performed biological studies and showed that indeed the non-coding sequence mutations reduce the red expression in gut in a post-translational manner. In order to understand the heterogeneity and complexity of the disease, six leading centers in uh, the study of Hirschsprung's disease came together to form the International Hirschsprung's Consortium, uh, for, uh, of which we are one of them. And we were then able to study over 800 families of Hirschsprung's disease and dissect out the differential contribution of the coding sequence mutation and the non-coding sequence mutations. In a nutshell, what we found was that the rare variants or the coding sequence mutations which have the damaging effect by altering the structure uh, or, the, the, uh, or the, uh, the production of the protein, they contribute to the um, risk, the, the high risk patients of females, total colon agangenosis, and the familial cases. On the other hand, the so-called common forms of Hirschsprung's disease, namely the males, the short segment, and the sporadic patients, they more often harbor the, the common but less damaging non-coding sequence mutation. In, in addition to the red non-coding sequence mutation, this understanding of how gene function works also allows us to have a peep into the very intriguing biological question as to why Hirschsprung's disease, the, the commoner form, occurs more often in male patients. We found that SOX10 interacts with the enhancers HEX3 and the NKX3 um, uh, 2 here, uh, 1, to form transcriptional complexes, which then activate RET. The male gene, um, SRY, what we call the sex determining region Y gene, encodes the factor that competitively displaces SOX10, thereby repressing their regulatory function on RET. And with this, 
there is a possible mechanism that the resultant lower uh, red protein expression in the cell, that what we call haploinsufficiency, promotes Hirschsprung's disease development and explains the male preponderance. So now we begin to understand that the development of uh, the enteric nervous system is very much a gene controlled uh, event. But no genes exist in, in a, uh, as an island. No cells exist as an island. They all interact with each other through signaling pathways so that you really require the synchronization and the balance of this pathway in order to develop the entire nervous system at the right time in the right place. Here, I will show you that we venture further into understanding how some of these signaling pathways work. Hox B5 uh, is a member of the Hox family, which controls body patterning. By going through the candidate approach, we understand that this could be a, um, important for entire nervous system. And therefore, doing a, uh, a transgenic experiment that allows us to engrave the Hox B5 into the uh, neural crest of mice, we were able to replicate the Hirschsprung's phenotype in this Milton mouse. You can see that there is the mega ileum and the constricted distal bowel compared to the normal. And that indeed, if we then sequence uh, Hox B5, we found a higher frequency of the Hox B5 variants amongst Hirschsprung's patients. So this is one important intracellular signaling pathway. But we've also talked about the importance of the gut mesenchyme. And here is an example where the gut mesenchyme secretes factors which communicate with the neural crest cells, thereby uh, affecting its development. Some 10 years ago, we undertook what would be considered as one of the earliest stem cell studies in um, neural crest and found that they grow very nicely into neural spheres and that the growth of these neural spheres was promoted by sonic hedgehog, which also reduces neural crest migration and differentiation. And most recently, we look at the interaction of different pathways. So whilst sonic hedgehog has been identified as a candidate pathways, singly, we could not find any genes in this pathway that were mutated in Hirschsprung's patients. We searched through our genome-wide association study data more carefully, and that, to our surprise, we found that, in fact, when this risk factor is combined with another risk factor, namely the not signaling pathway, it then presents a higher susceptibility, disease susceptibility risk. So we created a transgenic mouse model whereby the heterox signaling pathway was constitutively activated through the deletion of its receptor patch one. And indeed, we found that in these mutant mice, the notch is activated. We further found that there is a premature gliogenesis in these mutant mice. And when we repeat these experiments with human enteric uh, neural crest cells, we confirmed that indeed um, hedgehog and notch combined 
to promote gluogenesis. So we have this explanation of how it happened. In the normal event, you require the hedgehog signals to allow proliferation of the early progenitor cells. Then it needs to be taken out of the uh, pathway to allow the cells to exit the, the, the cell cycle of proliferation to develop into neurons. And when sufficient neurons have developed, son hedgehog, hedgehog will reactivate the uh, notch and then trigger off gliogenesis in this chronologically um, uh, logical sequence. However, if you have a constitutive activation of the uh, notch signaling pathway by constantly uh, activating through the hedgehog pathway, then you reduce the entire neural crest cell pool and therefore results in hypoganglionosis. So, what are the implications of all these um, studies? In fact, we've learned some lessons from this, and this has allowed us, for example, to undertake genome-wide association studies in other birth defects like biliary atresia, which then allowed us to um, identify a susceptibility gene called ADD3, which affects the cilia of the biliary tree. As to the future of um, Hirschsprung's disease studies, I submit that we will need an integrative approach. We have now various animal models. We have the power of genomics. We can now also make use of the pluripotent stem cells that will allow us to formulate an integrative strategy of gene discovery through the use of the very powerful next generation sequencing technology called whole, sequen whole genome sequencing. But once we've identified the new genes, we will need to validate that they do actually confer disease susceptibility. And this we, will, we can interrogate through both animal studies as well as now using the cellular approach by having the patients uh, induce pluripotent stem cells, we then correct the genetic mutations in these uh, patients' pluripotent stem cells and turn the clock back and study the development of the enteric nervous system on these patients' stem cells. Likewise, we can also insert a mutation into the, a normal human embryonic stem cell and then see how over the course of time how its uh, development uh, is disturbed. So with this, we hope that we will achieve the ultimate goal, that we can all bring back these laboratory data to integrate with the clinical information of the patients that provided these uh, genetic data, allowing us to have a better risk prediction, which will then uh, hopefully uh, allow us to, to plan for a stratified strategy according to risk prediction of success of patients to get better care for the uh, ordinary Hirschsprung's patients. And then for those few patients with the extreme condition of total intestinal aganglionosis, we're hoping that the cell-based therapy would provide them with the ultimate solution. I would like to here to acknowledge um, the group of um, scientists uh, who helped me do all this work. I'm also blessed with a young group of surgeons who do um, most of the uh, clinical work while I uh, uh, engage myself in this uh, scientific fantasy. I think that uh, Hirschsprung would approve of this. 
But eventually, what matters is whether we make a difference to the patients. So my final tribute is actually to the patients who over the years have, uh, through their resilience, inspired us to a, onto a journey of inquiry to try to uh, get a better deal, better treatment for them. With innovation and technology, even walking on water is easy. So uh, to dream of having a better care for Hirschsprung's disease is really not impossible, just so long as we build a bridge between surgery and science. With that, I'd like to thank you once again and welcome you to Hong Kong anytime. Thank you very much. No. Sorry, I still have some questions. Anyway, Professor Tam, thank you very much. Uh -huh. We're supposed to hold this so we can get a picture. The, uh, the American Pediatric Surgical Association wants you to have this plaque to remember this day. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.